my, the things that I, I've had on my mind, um, I, I'd love to elaborate more on the Antichrist if you have any additional thoughts on that. I just think that's a critical yeah. thing to understand. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I think it's something we need to know so they know what to expect if such an individual arises. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I wouldn't mind discussing a little bit about Ezra's eagle if you have any other newer thoughts on that and concerning Biden and his situation and uh, anything concerning current positioning or changes in the church that may apply to NBA stuff, you think that's significant? So um, you, you, you'd like to talk about the Antichrist. You'd like to talk about Ezra Siegel. Uh, you'd like to talk about you know current events and just kind of the you know the general temperature of you know where we're at in, in things. And I think that Daniel is the perfect springboard for that kind of a conversation. Um, now, you know, most of us are are familiar with Daniel chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Um, and as I have studied the book of Daniel, I believe, you know, and I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts on, on why this is the case. But if you look at Daniel chapter 2, Jan Daniel chapter 7, 8, uh, 11, and 12, the revelations that are given in all of those chapters, I believe, are all building on one another. And they're all talking about the same thing. And when talking about Ezra's eagle, uh, when Ezra saw this incredible vision, it was prefaced with, hey, this part wasn't expounded to your brother Daniel, so I'm expounding um, it to you now. So before we jump into Ezra's eagle, it's important to understand what Daniel um, saw and, and what is being expounded upon. So really quickly, Nebuchadnezzar's dream this big, you know, statue, it's compo comprised of four different types of metals. Uh, the head is made of gold. The arms and chest are silver. The torso is made of brass. And then you have these legs that are made of iron. And we're, we're told that the iron legs, um, you know, iron is, you know, stronger than any of the other uh, metals by far. And the symbolism there is that it, it breaks in pieces all of these other uh, kingdoms and is the dominant uh, force in the world. And what we're to understand by this is that each, each metal represents a different kingdom. And then there's this stone cut without hand that rolls down the mountain and you know, breaks apart all of the kingdoms of the earth. And then the, the earth is inherited uh, by the saints. <clears throat> so when you look at that, and then you flip over to Daniel 11, you'll see that this is the same vision again. It's just uh, tweaked a little bit. And when you look at these different revelations from Daniel, you can see that the Lord is building line upon line, precept on precept. Each vision contains more information. It's a little bit different um, from the other information. And when you look at it all together, it presents a much more complete understanding of these things. And we'll also talk briefly about how other people saw these same things and how those, those tie in and how it can help our understanding of what's going on in the last days. So if you have your scriptures and you want to follow along with me, just you know, open up to Daniel chapter 7. And in verse 3, um, it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, here, you know, obviously there's four beasts coming up out of the sea, and the statue was made of four different uh, metals. Those things are, are similar. But here we understand, you know, these beasts are rising up out of the sea, and this there's symbolism here, because in ancient times and even, you know, today, you know, we're very familiar with the surface of the ocean, but when you go beneath the surface, it's mysterious, particularly in, in ancient times. You just didn't know what was down there. Uh, even today, I mean, we have explored next to nothing when it comes you know, to the ocean. So this, the symbolism here is there are things going on in these countries that are not apparent and obvious on the surface. So then let's, let's just jump into uh, this and read about you know, these, 
these different um, uh, kingdoms. The first, meaning the first kingdom, was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon its feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. So if, if you're familiar with, um, let's see if I have a picture of this one up here. If you're, uh, I don't think I do. Um, if you're familiar with Babylon, you've probably seen this picture of a winged lion that has a king's head on it. Um, that was you know, kind of a quintessential icon of Babylon's power. And so this, this is you know, identifying this first kingdom with Babylon. And in fact, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, Daniel told him, you know, the head of gold represents you, uh, Babylon. So we have a, a lion. And then uh, in verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second, likened to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between the teeth of it. And they said, and they said Thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. Now when you read Daniel chapter 8, it's talking about the, king, uh, the next kingdoms that come up after, ba uh, after Babylon falls. And it's described as Medio-Persia. So this bear that is rising to power is now the kingdom of you know, Persia and the Medes. And Daniel is there in Babylon when uh, this transition of power takes place. He witnesses it. And in, in fact, um, if you look at the um, <clears throat> heading on chapter 7, <clears throat> it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So this is still Babylon in this vision which is why you see the, the first uh, beast. <clears throat> but when you flip over to Daniel like 11, you can see that I also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. So now we've got, when you <clears throat> read about this vision and these kingdoms starting in Daniel 11, well, it starts with the kingdom of, uh, of Medio persia instead of Babylon, because Babylon has already fallen at that point. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So this, this bear represents the second kingdom. Then we move on to chapter 6, where there's this leopard. And it says this, And after this I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon its back uh, four wings of a fowl. Uh, the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given uh, unto it. Okay, so we have a leopard with four heads. So that's clearly um, significant to what this kingdom is and what it's talking about. Also, again, if you just look at the uh, chapter heading of, uh, of verse 8, you can see that the kingdom that comes after Media and Persia is, is Greece. And I would say it's the Greco-Roman Empire. And the first you know, kind of founder of that empire was Alexander the Great. And he was just, if you're familiar with history, you know, Alexander Great is unequaled in history as far as his military prowess was concerned. And I mean, even at a very young age, he was unstoppable. He is the only general in recorded history to never have lost a single battle. And in the battle where he defeats Persia, it, it's amazing because the ancient historians say he went against the Persian Empire and some accounts say that the Persians had a million soldiers uh, on the ground and um, uh, Alexander the Great came with 35,000 soldiers against you know an army many many times their size and was victorious in fact you know they say that um, his army Alexander the Great's inflicted over 300,000 deaths and they took prisoner over 300,000 uh, people. So there was at least 600,000. And according to those same uh, records, uh, Alexander the Great's army lost 100 men. So he was an incredible general and uh, strategist. But anyways, by the time he conquers the known world at that time, he's in his early 30s and he dies. And the kingdom is broken up, and it's not given to any of his children, but it's given to his four generals. And that's what these four heads represent, that uh, his kingdom would be divided up. But if you read uh, Daniel 11, and we won't get into this right now, it says that those four kingdoms would reunite. And they did reunite under Rome. <clears throat> and it's, you know, that's pretty interesting. So that's, that's this third um, beast that we see. 
And then we get to this fourth beast. And if you're familiar with the prophecy of Ezra's eagle, it occurs during the reign of this fourth beast. So let's look and see um, what Daniel has to say about this fourth beast. And it starts in verse 7. After this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Now you'll remember, the fourth kingdom in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream was made of iron legs, and the symbolism there was that it could crush all of the other kingdoms. Listen to what the symbolism of, this iron, of these iron teeth are. Um, it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were bo uh, born before it, and it had ten horns. So let's summarize this. We've got four beasts. In total, if you count the heads on these beasts, there's seven. Um, the first lion had one head. The, the bear had one head. The leopard had four heads. And then this uh, fourth beast has one head, but it has you know, iron teeth, and it has ten horns. Okay, so now let's flip over to the book of Revelation real quick. And let's look at Revelation chapter uh, 13, I believe it is. And listen to what John the Revelator sees. And you ask yourself if this is coincidental. So Revelation uh, uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And I stood upon the sands of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That's exactly what Daniel saw. And we're seeing the same kind of symbolism. Hey, there is something mysterious about this kingdom. It isn't what it appears on the surface. Just like below the surface of the ocean is a mystery to you, so is this kingdom. So let's continue. <clears throat> um, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. The other beast, you know, all four kingdoms that Daniel saw had a combined total of seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> and then it says, And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. So these, these ten kings associated with this you know, beast that John the Revelator has seen are blasphemous. Now listen to what verse 2 says. <clears throat> and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Okay, that's the third kingdom that Daniel saw. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. That's the second kingdom Daniel saw. And his mouth was the mouth of a lion. That's the first kingdom that Daniel saw. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So in other words, what we're to understand he, uh, from this is that this fourth kingdom has the power of every kingdom that's come before it, and more. Furthermore, it's blasphemous. <clears throat> so, you know, that's, that is um, very interesting, and now we're going to start talking about, one of your questions was about this Antichrist. And we're going to see that that is the reason that um, this fourth beast is associated um, with blasphemy. So let's flip, uh, flip back over to Daniel chapter 11, and I want to continue to ca uh, compare and contrast the book of Revelation to what Daniel saw, because it's going to rate, um, provide us some you know, valuable insight into what's going on. So I'm looking at verse 8 in Daniel 7, uh, and this is talking about the ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes likened to the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great uh, things. Now these things that this mouth uh, was speaking are blasphemous things. <clears throat> and we can see that by looking uh, over into uh, verse Verses 23 through 25. This is the ang the angel that's you know showing, walking Daniel through what he's seeing. Kind of explains this a little bit more. In verse 23, and he, the angel, said, "The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the entire earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces." And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall sub subdue three of these kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, 
and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change time and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until time and times and the dividing of time. So what we're seeing here is there's these ten horns, and they're associated with this fourth kingdom. And when we go back to uh, the vision of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and you, you study that, you'll see that the legs of iron, something happened and it, the legs fractured. And then it talks about the, the statue's ten iron toes. Those ten iron toes are these ten uh, kings. It's the same, I mean, there's amazing symmetry across Daniel's visions. But it says that these toes are held together. In fact, after this kingdom is fractured, it's held together with miry clay. And the explanation is <clears throat> iron and clay, they don't mix together. And so there's something unusual about this fracturing. It is not natural. It's, it's contrived. But the power of iron is still in that kingdom. And so what we're talking about here with these ten horns is these ten horns have contrived something. And it has fractured this fourth uh, kingdom. And as a result of that fracturing, they govern um, the entire world for a time. And now let's, let's just compare and contrast this again back with the book of Revelation. And you'll see John is seeing the exact same thing here. So um, let's look at verse 3 in Revelation chapter 13. And I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around like a ping pong but ball, but this is going to you know, lay the groundwork for some of our... Um, conversation after this. And I saw one of this beast that rose up out of the sea, seven heads, and it were wounded as it were to death. And this deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after this beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. In Revelation, Satan is um, always uh, described as being a dragon. So, in other words, Satan is, is empowering this organization to obtain uh, the rule over all of the uh, earth. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, and there was given unto him this, this conglomerate you know, organization that's seeking power and control over the entire earth, uh, earth, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for 42 months. So this is the same thing that Daniel saw. Okay, he saw that mouth, the horn with the mouth and the eyes like a man, and that he continued for time and times in the dividing of time. Well, times is one, uh, or time is one, times is two, and the dividing of time is a half. So you got three and a half, and, um, or meaning three and a half years. And that is exactly what John the Revelator is saying right here, that this, you know, blasphemous, powerful person um, is going to continue uh, in his rule for three and a half years. It doesn't say at this point how many years he's already been here, only that, you know, from this point, he's got three and a half uh, years left. Now, listen to what it says that this guy does in verse six. <clears throat> and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That is exactly the same thing that Daniel saw. What we're talking about is the rise of an incredible Latter-day Antichrist who is going to be able to overpower the saints. Now, there is kind of a general belief, um, and, and this, this belief is really uh, kind of unique to Latter-day Saints, that this, that there is no antichrist, only kind of a general um, feeling in society of a general you know, philosophy of antichrist. But that is not what John is seeing, and it's not what Daniel is seeing. There is going to be a person. Um, Paul talks about this guy, and he refers to him as the son of the uh, perdition. And he, he says, listen, guys, the second coming is not going to happen until you see this guy. 
And he is going to sit in the temple of God to show the world that he is God. Okay, so that is not a general feeling of Antichrist or a philosophy of Antichrist. It is an actual Antichrist. And when you, you go back to the Book of Mormon and you look at what happened to bring about the collapse of the Nephite government right before um, Christ came for the first time, you see that there was an Antichrist whose name was Jacob that you know, arose with the intention of usurping the power of governance of the people. I believe that that is a mirror of what we're going to see here. And you know, the, the only time, the only person who ever uses the term Antichrist in the scriptures is John. Um, and he uses, I mean, I think if you go to, uh, you, you can just look this up later, but if you go to uh, John chapter three, I, I'm, I think this is first John uh, chapter three, and you read that, he's talking about, listen, an antichrist will come. And when he comes, we will know that it's the last days. Um, and then he refers to the fact that there is a general feeling of antichrist in his day. And in fact, the first several chapters of the book of Revelation, he, go, he spends a lot of time talking about these, uh, this secret group that he refers to as the Nicolaitans that are infiltrating the seven churches of Rome. Uh, and they're trying to you know, infiltrate and control um, the narrative of those churches. And, you know, it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, you can see basically the rise um, of the apostasy in those, uh, those chapters there. But um, so clearly we're talking about the, the rise of this, this Latter-day Antichrist. And he doesn't rise on his own. He, he is empowered by this beast, this, this conglomerate. Um, these ten horns, um, which, you know, in the book of Revelation, we get, you know, additional information on these ten horns. And in Daniel, um, it described these ten horns as ten kings. Uh, John the Revelator provides even a little bit uh, clearer description of this. And if you flip over to Revelations chapter 17, you'll see this. Um, this is in Revelation 17, verse 12. Where are my glasses? <laughs> okay. Um, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. So this is the same thing. I mean, we're talking about ten men or we should we we have no idea if they're um, if they're all men, but they're ten leaders in the last days that have global influence, and they all get together. They're all on the same page. They want to give their power over to this beast, which represents a new rising world um, order. Um, and to be able to understand this you know, a little bit better, I think we need to turn over to the Book of Mormon. And if you go to the Book of Ether um, in the Book of Mormon. We're going to read a couple of interesting things. Let's start by going to Ether chapter 4. So, <clears throat> Ether chapter 4. <clears throat> this is interesting because we're reading the Book of Ether, but it is not Moroni or Ether who's talking in this verse. It's Jesus Christ. And he says something in Ether 4, verse 16, that we really need to pay attention to. Listen to what Jesus Christ says. And then shall my revelations, which I have caused to be written by my servant John, <laughs> um, be unfolded in the eyes of all people. Remember, when ye see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, that they shall be manifest in very deed. So, you know, Jesus Christ is saying, Listen, guys, in the last days, when the revelations that I gave to my servant John, they're going to unfold, and you're going to understand what they actually mean in those days. Be watching for that. Now listen to what, uh, a couple of chapters later, Moroni, um, he says that Christ commands him to give this additional instruction to us. 
Um, this is Ether chapter 8. I'm starting in verse 23. Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get upon you, which are built up to get power and gain. And the work, and the work, yea, even the work of destruction come upon you. Yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction, if ye shall suffer these things to be. Now, the context of this is, is Moroni is saying, listen, the Jaredites fell because a secret combination arose in their government and destroyed them. And then he says, the Nephites were destroyed because the same thing happened. And now he's saying, guys, this is going to happen to you. Now listen to what he says in verse 24. Wherefore, the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come, am come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which shall be among you, or woe be it unto you, or, or woe be it, or woe unto it, because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it, and also for those who build it up. For it cometh to pass that whosoever buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. This is what this fourth kingdom is. Okay, It's these ten horns that are, they have entered into this secret combination, and they are seeking to overthrow the governance of of the entire world. And according to what Daniel saw and John the Revelator saw, they are successful in that attempt. <clears throat> and when they obtain power, the, this, the, the foremost leader amongst them is this Antichrist. And he has, I mean, what the Antichrist can do defies description. And it's one of the reasons that he is described as being a god, and people will believe that he is God. Um, because, I mean, he does miracles in the eyes of all people. These aren't fake tricks. What he does is real, and people have no explanation for it. And as a result of that, faith begins to collapse. Now, this has to happen before the second coming of the Lord, because you know, right now, this sifting is accelerating, and it's, it's becoming more and more um, difficult to sit on the fence. But once this guy comes to the scene, it will be impossible. There will be no lukewarm people. There will be people that believe this guy, and there will be people that say, No, I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the entire world will be sifted into two groups. It's not going to be about denominations, which denomination you um, subscribe to. It's going to be about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. And so I believe that there's going to be a tremendous brotherhood um, amongst the saints and amongst everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ because we're going to be joint, um, you know, we're going to suffer together um, this, the persecution that this Antichrist begins to heap upon us. And, and remember, he overcomes us. We are given into his hand, and it says, you know, until time and times in the dividing of time. But now let, let's go and back to Daniel 11, and let's just read what Daniel saw ultimately stops this Antichrist in the last days. And... You know, up to this, I mean, this is, this is some scary stuff we're talking about. But this is where it gets really cool, in my opinion. So <clears throat> we're in Daniel 7. Now we're into verse 9. And Daniel said, I beheld, you know, remember, the verse right before this is, you know, this, this Antichrist who's speaking all these blasphemies. And Daniel beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Now, it is commonly understood that the Ancient of Days is Adam. We know that Adam is going to come back and preside over, you know, a, an incredible meeting in Adam on Diamond, where all the dispensation heads are going to meet 
and you know they're they're going to um, give an accounting of their keys. But I believe that there is going to be much more planning involved in this meeting than than just an accounting of priesthood keys. And this is this is why I say this. Um, so he sees Adam who um, who did sit whose garments whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. What the heck are wheels? Um, and what do they have to do with Michael sitting on a flaming throne? Well, if you look in this, if you have your scriptures, you'll see that there is a reference um, next to wheels. And it says, the reference is Ezekiel 1, 15. Now, if you turn over to Ezekiel 1, chapter 1, that reference is talking about four living creatures that are standing next to four wheels. And you really need to read that whole chapter to understand, you know, what he's talking about. So Ezekiel sees this crazy vision where he looks up into the sky and it's like he sees a whirlwind in the sky, but it's, it's a fire enfolding in on itself, spinning in a, in a rotation. And he's in awe by it. And then he sees descending from the clouds, these, he sees four wheels. And the wheels aren't rolling like a wagon wheel. He describes them as going upon their four sides meaning that they're moving like a frisbee, not like a rolling wheel. <clears throat> and he describes them as having eyes all around the perimeter of the wheel. And that when they come to the ground, four living creatures come out of them. And the four living creatures each has four faces. The face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a flying eagle, and the, the face of a man. <clears throat> now, I mean, think about it. How do you have the face of a flying eagle? Uh, <clears throat> you know, you either have the face of an eagle, um, but curiously, it's described as a face of a flying eagle. Well, this is, this is the exact um, symbolism that was portrayed in the four standards of the four camps of Israel that camped around the tabernacle of the congregation when it was in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, Judah had the ensign of a lion. That is why Jesus Christ is known as the Lion of Judah. Then you had uh, the camp of Joseph, whose emblem was an ox. That is why you have the baptismal font resting upon the back of four uh, or of 12 oxen divided into four groups representing the four camps of Israel. But Joseph's paramount responsibility to bring the gospel ordinances in the last days to the entire house of Israel. So just like Joseph of Egypt preserved Israel in the last days, Joseph will bring the gospel, the ordinances, uh, saving ordinances of the gospel to the entire house of Israel in the last days. And then you have uh, Reuben, whose standard was the silhouette of an Israelite, a man. And then you had Dan, whose uh, uh, banner was a flying eagle. <clears throat> so what I believe that you're seeing here is Daniel sees, listen, these guys, they're having serious problems with this Antichrist until time and times in the dividing of time. Meaning, until this Antichrist only has three and a half years left. But when something happens uh, at three and a half years, that changes everything. Now, you, uh, and it has to do with these wheels that you know, arrived you know, around the same time that uh, Michael comes and sits on his throne and has that meeting in Adam and Diana. Now, <clears throat> there, I find it very interesting that there are multiple prophecies in the last days and also in several of the Dead Sea Scroll uh, documents that I've read that describe this event um, as the ships of Chittim returning and confronting this Antichrist. In fact, you can read you know, about this in Daniel 11, uh, verse 30. This, you know, this, this Antichrist is about to go to war uh, against the, um, the Middle East, and he's thwarted in that war because of verse 30. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him, 
Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So he associates the ships of Chittim coming and you know rebuffing him with the holy covenant. That is very interesting. And then listen to what he does. So shall he do, even... Um, shall he return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant? So in other words, the ships of Chittim return and the Antichrist, his plans are thwarted. And the very next thing that he does is tries to get as much information about the covenants of the house of Israel that he can. And he, he tries to get this from people who forsake their covenants meaning people that, you know, once had made those covenants, but now have rejected them. Again, you look at the Book of Mormon as the template for these kinds of things. Far and away, the most wicked characters in the Book of Mormon were those who were once filled with light and turned against that light and, you know, chose darkness instead. And they never again returned to the light. So this is, this is what we're seeing. This Antichrist gets intelligence from what's going on uh, with these guys. <clears throat> so now, you know, we've been talking about you know, a lot of things, but I just want to kind of close the loop on this. I want to flip over to Revelations chapter uh, 12. And I just want to close the loop on what this three and a half years means. Um, <clears throat> so if you go to Revelation chapter 12... Um, let's see, uh, that's, that's not the one I was thinking of. I'm sorry, it's Revelation chapter 11. So it is amazing when you, when you look at the books that we have been studying recently, come follow me, I'm talking Jeremiah, I'm talking Ezekiel and Daniel, Isaiah. Um, these are all prophets when Israel went into captivity. Isaiah was the prophet when the northern kingdoms of Israel disappeared. Um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they were all prophets when the remaining portion of um, Israel went into captivity uh, in Babylon. And so the, the similarities between what these people saw and what John the Revelator saw are striking to me. For example, in Ezekiel um, chapter 1, for instance, we read about you know, those uh, four wheels that descended from heaven and you know, that they had the faces of an ox, a, a, a lion, an eagle, and a man. If you look, you know, uh, in Revelation chapter 4, um, you'll see that John sees before the throne of God a beast um, that, you know, had the head of a lion, a head of a calf, a head of an eagle, and the head of a man. Again, you're having the rep, uh, uh, this is the symbolism of the house of Israel before the throne of God. Um, so he saw that. Um, he, Ezekiel saw this incredible vision. If you read the chapter heading of Ezekiel 40, you see that Ezekiel sees the temple that will exist in Jerusalem in the last days, except for it's not in Jerusalem at this time. It's, in, it's somewhere else. And one of the things that he's commanded to do is measure uh, the temple with a rod, and he does that. This is what John the Revelator is doing in this chapter, but he provides some very valuable information as to what this three and a half years means. So Revelation chapter 11, verse two. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, shall they tread underfoot for uh, 40 and two months. If you divide 42 months by 12, it's three and a half years. That's time and times in the dividing of time. Now listen to what happens in verse three. I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. These two witnesses are the two prophets that are going to be in Jerusalem in the last days that are going to preserve Jerusalem from falling in the hands of this Antichrist for three and a half years. If you take 1,260 and divide it by 30, um, you're going to get 42, which is 42 months, three and a half years. So what we're talking about is three and a half years, um, this Antichrist is going to get bumped 
out of what I believe is America. And at that um, time, he is going to attack Jerusalem because it's the only portion of the house of Israel that he has access to at this point because of the ships of the ships of Chittim that are present in um, America at this time. And if you recall, there are many prophecies that talk about how in that day, anyone who will not take up their sword against their neighbor has to make their way to Zion because it is the only place where, that won't be, you know, engulfed in war. Um, and it says that the reason that that is the case is because the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand, meaning we cannot go against uh, Zion because the house of Israel is there. The ships of Chittim are there. They'll clean our clots. We cannot do that. <clears throat> so what do they do instead? They go against the Jews in Jerusalem. Now, there's some very important information that is provided <clears throat> regarding these two prophets in Jerusalem, which is found in Doctrine and Covenants section 77. Now, Doctrine and Covenants section 77 is a question and answer section where they ask questions to the Lord and he provides the answers. And uh, in verse, I believe it's 14. Let me flip over there. Um, no, this is verse 15. They ask, who are these two witnesses that are spoken about uh, in the book, the 11th chapter of Revelation, the chapter we just read. Now, it says this, chapter or verse 15. What is to be understood by the two witnesses in the 11th chapter of Revelation? They are two prophets that are to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days at the time of restoration. Think about that. These two prophets arrive in Jerusalem at the time of restoration. What restoration are we talking about? We're not talking about the restoration of the gospel, which happened in 1830. Think of the 10th article of faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. This is when these two prophets return to Jerusalem at the restoration of the lost tribes of Israel, when the ships of Chittim return. Um, this is discussed in another section of uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Um, this is section 133. Um, and I promise I'm going to stop talking pretty soon here and you know, clarify anything that I've said and you know, answer any more questions. But this is laying some good groundwork, I think. So, um, section 133. <clears throat> Listen to this. Um, 133, beginning in verse 26. And they who are in the north countries. This is referring to the lost tribes of Israel who are in the north countries now. They shall come in remembrance before the Lord. And their prophets shall hear his voice. Listen to what that said. Their prophets. Not our prophets. The prophets of the ten tribes of Israel will hear his voice and shall no longer stay themselves. They've been waiting for something. And they shall smite the rocks and the ice shall flow down at their presence and an highway shall be cast up out of the midst of the great deep. This is um, reminiscent of the Red Sea being divided in half and the house of Israel being delivered from the armies of Pharaoh in a miraculous fashion. In fact, if you read in the Bible dictionary under Israel Kingdom of, and you look at the last two paragraphs, it states that when the lost 10 tribes are restored, it will happen in a manner that will rival the exodus of Egypt. This is you know, paralleling that. It's confirming that that will be the case. Um, and then listen to what the first thing that happens when these guys come back is. It's talked about in verse 28. Their enemies shall become a prey unto them. They come, once Israel is restored, they start, you know, going to town on this Antichrist um, and, you know, the wicked. And 
they, they liberate you know, the North American continent. And in verse 29, And in the barren deserts there shall come forth pools of living water, and the parched ground shall no longer be a thirsty land. And they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. Okay, the children of Ephraim, that represents the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is the symbolism of the baptismal font on the 12 brass oxen, the symbol of Ephraim. Um, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. If you listen to the spoken word, you'll often hear from the shadow of the everlasting hills. This is saying the Salt Lake Valley will tremble at these guys' presence when they come to it. And in verse 32, And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hand of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. Friends, we're talking about an event here, not a process. And we're talking about an event that is going to knock our socks off. And it's going to knock the socks off of this Antichrist. He's, it's not on his radar, just as it's not on most of our radar. Um, so this has been you know, a big lead up now to talking about you know, Ezra's eagle. So, but, but before we start jumping into Ezra's eagle, does anybody have <laughs> any questions about anything that I've just, you know, talked about? Because, you know, I talk, it's been an hour now. I can't believe I talked for an hour straight. But um, any, any questions about anything that I have said, anything that I can, you know, help you to understand a little bit better before we start moving on? So, to go back, you talked about the Antichrist, and I've heard a lot of people, I don't necessarily agree with them, but they say that the Antichrist is a system, and I, I know there's a few groups that firmly believe that. Um, I mean, well, you said you very well that it, it, there's an actual Antichrist that comes forth at some point, but yeah. it's this system of the ten toes that run the show for a while, right? Yeah, that, that is correct. I mean, you know, what, what they're saying is not wrong. It's just not complete. And that is one of the things that is going to be so shocking for so many people. Because people are expecting, I mean, we have a very hard time. Anybody who forecasts things, they use the past to forecast the future. The problem here is we are going to see things that have never happened before. Never. And so how can you forecast that? What we have as our template is you know, the Book of Mormon. If you, you know, let, let, let's just look you know, in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, was there a general feeling of Antichrist? Absolutely, yes, there was. That was real. But also, in the Book of Mormon, let's just, I'm just going to read to you the chapter heading of, ver, of chapter 7 in 3 Nephi. The chief judge is murdered. The government is destroyed. The people divide into tribes. Jacob, an antichrist, becomes king of a secret combination. Jacob is a person. He is a type of what is going to happen in the last days. Now, Nephi, he transcribed all of these Isaiah chapters. And the Isaiah chapters that he described are very clear that there will be an Antichrist in the last days. Isaiah always refers to this guy in the same way. He calls him the Assyrian. And when he talks about what is going to happen to the Assyrian, um, it's associated with the restoration of the house of Israel. So, I mean, I, I mentioned that... Um, John the Revelator talked about this Antichrist in 1 John verse 3. Let's just, let's just flip over there uh, because of this, this question. Let's just look at, let's look at you know, what he says specifically. Because he clearly talks about a general thing, but then he says there's something more. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm in John chapter 2. 
Let's just look at that heading. Christ is our advocate with the Father. We know God by obedience. Love not the world. Antichrists will come. Those are individuals. Will come. When you look at uh, Matthew chapter 24, um, Jesus Christ says, listen, in the last days, there will arise false prophets. Those are antichrists. They are individuals. And it says that they will be able to deceive even the very elect. In fact, he goes on to say, unless I shorten those days, no flesh will survive. That talks about how intense this man will be. Now, again, if you want you know, more, um, well, I, I didn't read the actual verse in uh, John, so let's just look at that. 1 John uh, 2, verse 18. Listen to what he says. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, that's an individual. John the Revelator knows that Antichrist shall come. But then he goes on to say, even now there are many Antichrists. So he's saying, listen, the big kahuna is coming. And we have the you know, little guys now, and they're trying to usurp the kingdom. But in the last days, someone different is coming. And he's going to overcome us. And we're going to be subjected to him. Let me just, um, let me just read a couple more verses out of the book of Revelation that I believe you know, further illustrate that we're talking about an individual, not... A philosophy. Look at Revelation chapter 13. And um, if you recall, let's, let's just um, review here. Let's go up to um, verse 5. And there was given unto this beast a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over him or given him over all kindreds, tongues and nations. This guy will rule the entire earth. Verse eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Okay. Whose names are not written in the book of life. They will think this guy is God. He is coming as a false messiah. Um, and then let's go down to verse 13. Listen to what he does. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. He deceiveth them. We're talking about a man. Uh, if you let, let's just keep going on because some of these verses I know you're very familiar with. Um, and he deceiveth them on the earth by the means of those miracles. Listen, he is doing these miracles. He is an antichrist because Christ did miracles. Okay, Christ wasn't a general philosophy. He was a man. This antichrist will be a man. You can point to him and say, look at what he is doing. Explain to me why he can do this if he is not who he says he is. Okay. And then um, it goes on to talk about some of the, th the things that he does. So he deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Now, an image in the Old Testament, when you made an image, you made the body of a false god and you worshiped that. Now, listen to what he said that this man does to this image. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast, beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and rich, 
and poor and free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark of the beast, the name of the beast or the number of his name. <clears throat> so I think that all of these things show that we're not talking about some general organization. We're talking about a man who has incredible power for which we have no answer. We have no response. It's, Daniel said that this guy will seek to change time and laws. What does that mean? I believe that it means that he's going to come and he's going to provide evidence that turns our world upside down. Everything that we think we know, everything that we've been taught in our you know, history books, we're going to realize, holy smokes, it's not the whole story. And this guy has the whole story. I believe him. He's providing evidence of what he says. Um, and that is, you know, that is probably the most frightening thing that we, you know, about this guy. His ability to back up what he says and what he does. That is why he is described as uttering marvelous blasphemies. It is very hard not to believe what he says. Because in that day, we will not be able to prove that to anyone that Jesus is the Christ. But he will be able to prove all kinds of things, and we are going to look like idiots. Because we are going off of a feeling in our heart. And he is showing all of these things. And this is how the world is sifted so incredibly quickly. And it is one of the reasons that the Lord, you know, allows this to happen in the first place. <clears throat> Now, let me read you another um, passage that talks about this guy. I just want to drive this home that this is a man. Um, so let's look at 2 uh, uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I'm going to start in verse 3. <clears throat> let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord. That day shall not come except there, um, let's see, I lost my place. Except there come a falling away first. Now, as missionaries, we would use this as evidence of the great apostasy. That's actually not what it's talking about. It's talking about the falling away, the utter collapse of faith that will precede the second coming when this guy comes. Uh, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing um, himself that he is God. We're talking about a man, and he does these things. Now look in verse 8. And then shall that wicked, meaning this Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Let's talk about what, how that happens after we finish this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is a man who is empowered by Satan to do crazy things that we cannot explain. Now in verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had the pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, the Lord is saying, listen, I am coming, and you know, no you know, unclean thing can dwell in my presence. And so there has to be a tremendous sifting that takes place before I come. Just think about what happened, again, using America as the template, when Christ came to America, after the tremendous destruction that preceded his coming. For several generations, 
Not a single soul was lost. Everyone who experienced those incredible things never fell away. That's what happens during the millennium. Everybody that makes it to the millennium will not fall away. They will make it. And so the Lord is sending this incredible sifting event that will precede the second coming. And people that have not learned to live their lives by the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost will not survive that day. They will be deceived. Even the very elect will be deceived by this guy. And the reason that they will be deceived is because he's not even on their radar. They don't know that he's coming. We do a terrible job talking about these things. One of the reasons we don't talk about these things is because they're weird. And when you talk about them, you sound like you have lost your mind. But here it is, you know, in the scriptures. So, I, yeah. Can I ask a question? Because I have to go in a minute and I don't want to. Yeah, you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Go ahead. So, like, and, and thanks for all that information. You know, I, I really appreciate it. Um, Ezra's Eagle, you know, we're, you know, we're kind of in to that phase if this is to play out like we think it is, where Biden's probably on borrowed time. Um, can you speak to that a little bit or just maybe share some thoughts about that? Yeah. So then jumping to this vision of Ezra's Eagle. So um, obviously the angel told Ezra, listen, Daniel saw these things, but this part wasn't expounded to him. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this. And he, he goes into great detail. We don't have to go into that kind of detail right now about this kingdom, which he refers to um, as the fourth kingdom or the fourth beast in that revelation. Um, and I believe that you know, the whole premise of that revelation, all of these feathers, the long and the short feathers, and the timing of when these feathers begin corresponds with you know, when this secret combination really gets hold in America. And then you have you know, the list of feathers, and we get down to now President Biden, who is you know, a short feather, and according to that prophecy, after Biden, <clears throat> there are two other short feathers who, interestingly enough, it says that they think in their hearts to take the rule, but the three heads of the Ezra's eagle wake up and devour them. So to me, and, and also that, that revelation says that Biden isn't in there for as long as Trump was. <clears throat> so... Biden is going to be removed, you know, before, you know, the end of his, you know, fourth term, which, you know, it would be January 20 something, uh, probably, or, you know, mid January of uh, 2025. So these two people, to me, it sounds like these two people think in their heart to um, take the rule, but they're devoured before they can. That almost sounds like these two guys won an election. And they're the next guys. And they're psyched that they're going to start turning things around again. And the three heads of this vision say, no way. Not a chance. And they take him out. They take him out in an event that I believe is the equivalent of the fracturing of the legs of iron. And now who is in control um, after this event? Well, it's the three eagle heads, according to this vision, but um, those three eagle heads are part of these ten horns that Daniel saw and that John the Revelator saw. And we know that those three eagle heads are plucked up by their roots by this Antichrist who is coming right on their heels. And in fact, if you read um, Daniel 11, it, he talks about these three. Um, eagle heads. And he, um, in, in the book of uh, Ezra's, you know, in the prophecy of Ezra's eagle, in 2nd Ezra, um, it says that the first of these eagle heads dies with great pain in his bed. He's a man, okay? He's not an organization, it's a person. And the second one is killed by the third. And the third one dies, you know, you know it says within days in Daniel 11. And then the Antichrist comes to power. So if 
I mean, from what, from your question, you know, I would say we are close to these events happening. Very, very close. Now, if you want um, an interesting timeline on this, you know, Daniel is awesome for timelines. And in fact, if you read in Daniel 11, I, I don't know how much time you have. You said you had to leave. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, I've got about five more minutes. I've got to go. Okay, well, well, then before I talk about that, I mean, is that, that's, that's my thoughts. I have, I have no idea when Biden is going to be removed. But in my opinion, it's probably going to be close to you know, when you know, these elections or when it becomes apparent that uh, Biden's not coming back. Um, and that two other people are going to, you know, take office that would change everything. So what, yeah, once yeah. that becomes known, more solidified, I think that's when you see this event come and it's, I mean, they're wiped out. Okay. So the idea of, of Trump being a short feather is that, you know, the election was potentially stolen from him and that's what he should have been potentially two term. So by Biden being a full term president, but voted out, that would still qualify him as the short brother, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, now, let, let me be clear. I don't know that Biden, Biden will be voted out. I do not believe that he will. You know, I, I do believe that you know, the Republicans are going to take both the House and the Senate. But you need a supermajority to impeach someone. I mean, you need, what, 67 votes. There's no way that we're going to have that. Biden will not, he will be, I mean, he may be impeached, but he's not leaving office. Not that way. I think that okay. I think that what you're going to see, and, and another reason that I don't believe that, if if Biden were literally impeached, what happens? Kamala Harris is the next president, and according to you know this prophecy, there is no you know next president after this. It's the three eagle hats. So I don't think that you have an impeachment. You know, I don't think that that is the way that Biden you know leaves office. You know, honestly, I think it's going to be something terrible. Um, I think, you know, thinking along the lines of 9-11, um, something like that. Uh, hopefully it's not. I mean, hopefully this whole vision of Esther's Eagle is, you know, not true. But um, because if it is true, it means things are about to change radically. The, the feet of iron are about to shatter. Um, and these 10 uh, leaders are about to gain the governance of the entire world, which happens. So. Thank you so much for that. Mm. I appreciate it. And sorry, yeah. I gotta go. <laughs> uh, all righty. Good talking. Uh, did, it, did anyone else have any uh, questions on any of that that I uh, mentioned? Yeah, I have a quick question from <clears throat> Dwayne Schallenberger. Yeah. Um, when you refer to the 10 horns, is that possible that that is the UN? What about the World Economic <laughs> Forum? Do you have any thoughts on that? And also, um, what is your indicator of when you feel the seven years of tribu tribulation begin? <clears throat> okay, that's great. That's a great question. Two, two great questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I'm going to just make sure that I don't forget what you said. <laughs> so the second question was the seven years. And remind me of what your first question was again. First question is the ten. Ten, ten, ten horns, do I think that they could be the unit? Uh, okay, so let's think about this. I mean, we hear lots of discussion about a new world order, the World Economic Forum, um, these global elites that are trying to obtain power over the world. Um, I believe that this whole apparatus that we're talking about, in scriptures, it's called the Whore of Babylon. Um, I think that this is what Nephi was talking about when he uh, talked about the great and abominable church, um, because he also refers to it as the whore upon many waters. Uh, I think that many people took that, interpreted that in a different way. But I think we're talking about this whore who sits upon many waters is active right now. And it is enriching you know, everybody that is part of the apparatus. Um, but interestingly enough, <clears throat> these ten horns, they're with, they side with the Antichrist, right? So these ten horns are certainly part of this apparatus right now. But I want to read something to you. Again, this is in the book of Revelation. That 
you know, I think gives you the answer to your first question about is the UN or the World Economic Forum um, these 10 uh, horns? And I believe that the answer is no. I believe that um, those are 10 individuals that are in positions of great power. Remember, it said that they, they uh, do not have a kingdom right now, but they are given uh, power with the beast for one hour. Um, now, one of the first things that the Antichrist does when he rises to power is absolutely destroys the whore of Babylon. You can read about this in Revelation chapter 17. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm just, we read uh, two of these verses, but I just want to put the other context in it. You, you'll see that. He ain't talking about the UN, okay? Um, Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. They don't have, they are in positions that will be very useful to the Antichrist to be able to make this conglomerate beast, um, which is separate from the whore of Babylon. Um, uh, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. Now listen to what happens in verse 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, the whore of Babylon, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the word of God shall be fulfilled. So the first thing these guys do is they destroy that apparatus. And one of the reason, reasons that they can do that is because of who the Antichrist is. He doesn't need the whore of Babylon, to do what he's going to do. He can do it on his own, which should tell you something about this guy. So these ten horns, three of them, they're the heads of Ezra's eagle. So then you've got, you know, really seven other ones. And, the, you know, this Antichrist, I mean, he'll probably subscript, you know, three other people in to backfill this, but they're pretty much running the show. It's not the World Economic Forum at this point. It's not, you know, the UN. It's these guys. They've done it, you know, with the help of Satan and with this new conglomerate that they um, use in the last days. <clears throat> so does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great explanation. It, it almost feels like all these groups ahead of time are laying the ground roots of secret combinations and then the bigger combination comes into effect. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, something, you know, one of these uh, heads on this beast that rose up out of the ocean that has the ten horns, um, it said that the head had received a deadly wound that should have killed it, uh, but it was miraculously healed. Um, and that that is the head that this, you know, beast is modeled after and everybody has to subscribe to it or die, basically. What I believe that is talking about is communism. Um, and you know, believe it or not, um, there are really three you know, groups vying for global dominance right now. You have the Whore of Babylon, you have Russia, and you have China. And China and Russia are joining forces, but really they both want to run the show themselves. But they know that they can't compete against this Whore of Babylon on their own. They need to join forces. So I think that um, personally, the Antichrist is going to use them as his apparatus. Get rid of the whore of Babylon and rise to power, you know, using a different structure. Who would you define as the whore of Babylon? <clears throat> well, I think that you know, the whore of Babylon, this, this is, I think that there are many people that are part of the whore of Babylon that don't have no idea that they are. Uh, we're told that Satan is the author of these secret combinations, which to me means he has the grand you know, game plan in mind and everybody else is being used as a pawn in his game. 
So I think that some of these people um, that are engaged in this, um, that are definitely allies of the Whore of Babylon, I, you know, I don't think that they have any clue that they are serving Satan's purposes. You know, I think that some of them think that they are doing the right thing and that they're fighting for justice and, you know, truth and, you know, freedom, when in reality they're doing the exact opposite. Um, so I don't, I don't think that you can point, you know, a finger and say it's this organization that is the whore of Babylon. I think that you have, there is definitely a secret combination that is, you know, trying to move this whole apparatus forward. And I believe that, you know, to be at the head of this organization, you have to be at the head of the most powerful country on the planet, which is the United States of America. So when you see the events of Esther's Eagle take place, those three eagle heads, they are, you know, they are in control. Okay, they're, they're calling the shots. We just don't know who they are right now. Um, but it will become very evident very quickly. And from reading uh, uh, Daniel chapter 11, to me, it becomes apparent that, well, let me just read this to you. This is fascinating to me. So this is Revelation um, chapter, or sorry, this is Daniel chapter 11. And I believe this is the passage that talks about the first um, eagle head. <clears throat> Let me get a drink before I read this. Okay. <clears throat> so in this passage, you know, the first eagle head, he's referred to as the king of the north. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand you know, I believe that this is the first eagle head, who I believe is going to, there's going to be, in my opinion, this is the gospel according to me. This is my theory of how this works. Um, I believe that there's going to be something terrible that happens. And he is going to point the finger at the Middle East and say, look what those guys did again. And he's going to go against them and, you know, do terrible things. And in verse 16, uh, it says, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will. This is the first eagle head. And none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which shall be consumed by him. And he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Meaning I think he's taking the U.S. military with him. And they have no idea that they're being used as pawns. They're upright ones. They think they're doing what's right. Um, and thus he shall do. And then this is the interesting part. I think this is where this Antichrist comes into play. And thus he shall do. And he shall give him, meaning this Antichrist, the daughter of women. <laughs> think about that. Think about that in context of what's going on today. Think about that in context of Jeffrey Epstein. Jeff Jeffrey Epstein's entire purpose for existing was to gain leverage political leverage over people that he could then control. And how did he do that? By giving them the daughters of women. Not women. He wanted something that he could really beat these guys over the head with, and that's pedophilia. Not having an affair. That is what this guy does to try to get power over the Antichrist. And it doesn't work. Um, the Antichrist instead takes him out and the other uh, two eagle heads after him. So... Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a long you know, answer to no, I don't think that uh, the Ten Horns are the UN um, or the G10 or, you know, you know, the World Economic Forum. I think that the, they may be people that are very powerful and in, influential in those organizations, but, you know, I think that this is more than that. I think this is something that is going to tie all three of these things together. And, you know, those groups, I mean, they're at odds against Russia right now. I mean, you look at the whole Ukraine thing and what's going on. I mean, the European Union, they want this war. Uh, they, they want a conflict against Russia. This is good for what they're trying to do. And honestly, they want conflict with China. 
they look at those two people as you know adversaries to them <clears throat> but they're also i believe looking at them as useful pawns in achieving their ends so uh good, good. oh then your next question you yeah, know which is you know i think this is an awesome question um so daniel if you look at uh daniel is the king of giving timelines okay <clears throat> If you look at in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel gives a timeline for when the Messiah will come the first time. And, you know, this is in Daniel 9, 25. He says, listen, 69 weeks after the proclamation to go and rebuild Jerusalem come uh, is given, Messiah will come and he will be cut off. Um, so when you look at that, you know, People interpret that 69 weeks to be sabbatical um, years. In, in other words, you've got each week um, is representing, um, you know, a year of Sabbath or seven uh, years of Sabbaths. So you have to multiply this by, by seven. Well, when you do that and when you look at when this edict uh, came out, which, you know, you can read about that in uh, Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 5. Um, and we know that that happened in uh, 445 BC. So if you, if you take this period of time and you multiply it out, it takes you right to 30 AD, which is when, I, or the beginning of the sixth week starts in 30 AD, which is when the Messiah began his, his mission and he's cut off during that week. So, you know, that is a pretty impressive timeline. So let's talk about some other timelines that Daniel gave. So in chapter 10 of Daniel, Daniel, and in chapter 10, Daniel is old. I mean, he's in his late 80s, early 90s at this point. And he, he wants to have an interaction with the Lord. And so he fasts for 21 days. And he says that this fast is grievous to him, okay? He's old. Fasting when you're old for 21 days is not easy. And then the Lord appears to him on the 21st day. And he says, I mean, first of all, Daniel sees this vision of the Lord that's amazing. And it mirrors the same vision of the Lord that John the Revelator had in Revelation chapter 1. And for the sake of time, we won't go into to that but it's it's the descriptions are exactly the same and then christ uh tells him listen i was held up for 21 days against the princes of persia you can't hold jesus christ up okay this is symbolic and in fact he says you know i'm telling you this so that you can understand the latter days so this 21 days is represented re representative of a period of struggle, like Daniel's fast was going to be for 21 days. <clears throat> but I believe that those 21 days represent 21 years. Now, <clears throat> it's very interesting when you look at, I said, when you look at Jeremiah and the other prophets of the captivity, you get amazing insights. Well, in Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah is called to be a prophet, and we, we understand the exact year that um, he was called to be a prophet because he says in what year um, of the king of Judah's reign he was called to be a prophet in. And so we understand that he was called in 626 BC. And in that chapter, the Lord tells him that he is going to hasten his work of destruction. And 21 years later, Babylon comes in and takes Daniel and all of the children of royal birth into captivity. And I do not think that that is uh, coincidental. That 21 years um, from the time that the Lord said, I'm going to hasten my work, is significant. Now, think about our day. We started to hear the term, hasten the work of salvation, in um, 
the year 2013. There was a, this was, you know, just several months after President Monson changed the age that missionaries could go on missions. And in um, the very next year, there was a worldwide conference where, you know, the Quorum of the Twelve came out and said, the Lord is hastening his work of salvation. So a very interesting thing happens if you say, okay, what if this 21 years, the 21 years that applied to the day when the Lord would hasten his work of salvation or, or of destruction in Jeremiah's day, applies to when the Lord said that he would begin, when he would hasten his work of salvation in the last days. Well, what is the Lord's work of salvation? I mean, we think about it from the terms of temple work and the gathering of Israel, and those things are all true. But from the perspective of the Jews, they have always been looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. To them, the work of salvation is the coming of the Savior to save them. And they are going to be having their heads handed to them when the Antichrist is here. So I believe that what we're talking about in this timeline is when the Lord comes to save the Jews. So if you take, if you add 21 years to when the Lord said, I am hastening the work of salvation, you get the year 2034. Now that is a very interesting year because it is exactly 2000 years from the time that Christ came to America. If you read um, 3 Nephi chapter 11, it says that Christ came in 34 AD in the chapter heading. <clears throat> so I find that interesting. So if this is the case, then all of these other timelines that Daniel gives us can be used, you know, from this three and a half years, we can say, okay, let's, let's look at that three and a half years starting from this work of salvation and go backwards. And so if you did that, that would mean that, you know, the Antichrist is sieging uh, Jerusalem in probably around, you know, the end of the year 2029. Um, and, uh, you know, 2029, 2030. And that happens because the restoration of Israel has happened. So you can say, well, then you're looking at a timeline for the restoration of Israel at about the year 2029, 2030. Um, which means, by the way, that you're looking at the new Jerusalem descending from heaven in roughly that same period of time. Which means preceding that, you talked about seven years of tribulation. Well, you know, that three and a half years is the halfway mark. So you talk about, okay, well, three and a half years prior to that would be around when this guy is coming to power, which would put it sometime around the year 2026. Which means you've got the events of Ezra's Eagle that have to happen sometime between now and then. <clears throat> so to me, this timing is pretty phenomenal. <clears throat> you know, how it, how it lines up. So if you're looking for kind of a, a timeline, and, and I rarely go on record giving timelines. <clears throat> um, but when you're talking about these things and you know how they mirror up with events that occurred in antiquity i think that these patterns they are absolutely going to repeat and in fact just look at one of the things that jeremiah was told by the lord to focus on in this period where he the lord was hastening his destruction and see if you can find any similarities between what happened in our church after the Lord said he was going to hasten his work of salvation. So go to you know, Jeremiah chapter 17. Um, and we're not going to read the chapter. We're just going to look at the chapter heading. And see if this sounds familiar. <clears throat> the chapter heading of Jeremiah 17 says this. The captivity of Judah comes because of sin and forsaking the Lord. Hallow the Sabbath day. Doing so will save the people. Shortly after, you know, the Quorum of the Twelve came out and said, the Lord is hastening his work. 
Within several years of that, they came out with this worldwide training on keeping the Sabbath day holy and the absolute importance of doing that. <clears throat> Is that a coincidence that that falls right in this timeline? I mean, to me, it's not. I mean, I think somewhere, yeah, I have, you know, I was recently studying, you know, the guidance that the Quorum of the Twelve gave during that worldwide training. And that training went on for years, if you recall. It was a serious focus of the church. Listen to why they said they were doing it. <laughs> I think this is interesting. <clears throat> the purpose of the church's recent emphasis on Sabbath observance is to help Latter-day Saints living in an age of doubt and fear, or in an age of doubt and fear, in, um, increase their faith in Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, also they said, We all need more faith, said Elder Kim B. Clark. The brethren are looking ahead and they see what's coming. Listen to what Elder Nash said. <clears throat> Members will need to increase their faith in the years to come. The First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve issued the family a proclamation to the world 20 years ago, he said, emphasizing its importance today. I have a feeling that this emphasis on growing faith in the Father and the Son through Sabbath observance is the same. There is faith that must be developed now that we will absolutely need in the years to come. You know, we're being prepared for what's about to happen. Um, I think that falls in this, this timeline that uh, you know, Daniel gave us. So, you know, these things, they're not far off. Um, I think people think that I'm crazy uh, when, you know, I talk about, listen guys, by the time this decade is over, we're going to have the New Jerusalem in America. And people say, no, 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 it can't have, we haven't even started building that. That's an entire city. Well, that's because you guys don't understand that the Lord is the God of the entire universe. And he is first and foremost a supernatural being. And he does things that are incredible. Now, what did he say he was going to do with the New Jerusalem? Where is it coming from? Look at Ether chapter 13. You know, this, this, if this is true, and, you know, it's not only Ether that's saying this, you can see how this could happen at the restoration of the um, entire house of Israel. I'm in Ether 13, and I'm reading verse 3. That it, meaning America, was the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven. The new Jerusalem is descending from the heavens, just like the city of Enoch is descending from the heavens. John the Revelator, he saw the exact same thing. If you look over in Revelations chapter 20, you'll, you'll see this. Um, let me flip there really quick. Revelations 20, right here. <clears throat> um, sorry, it's Revelations 21. And I, John, saw the, whole si the holy city, New Jerusalem, Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned, adorned for her husband. You know, this is going to happen instantaneously. It's going to be an event that one day it's there, the next day it's not. I mean, one day it's not there, the next day it is. Uh, just like the restoration of the house of Israel. It's an event. Um, so, yes, we have some scary things that are coming our way. But, my word, we have some incredible things coming our way. When President Nelson says the greatest miracles the Lord has ever performed will happen in the coming days, not the coming generations, this is what he's talking about. The restoration of the House of Israel, the establishment of Zion upon the North American continent, um, the miraculous preservation of the righteous by the administration of the 144,000 that go forth to every continent regardless of what the government of those countries wants to happen, the 144,000 goes and gathers the righteous into Zion, where they're safe. I mean, incredible things are about 
you know, to take place soon. So, great, yeah, great question. Yeah, what do you got? Okay, first of all, Michael, thank you so much for doing this for us. This is really my pleasure taking time like this. Uh, this is awesome. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a multi-part question. The first one is, um, when you look at the ships of Shittim, as you see there in verse 30 on the end of 11, yeah. in verse 32, you get that interesting scripture where it says that the God shall be strong in the exploits. Yeah. Now, do you mean, do you believe that's at all, that, that because, I, and help me walk me through this, the timeline from about three and a half years, from this antic comes on the scene. Yeah. Generally, what is your thought, and what does it look like to the saints, specifically in the U.S.? Because I think it's going to be very different from saints all around the world, right? But what do you think that looks like, in your opinion, in the U.S. for saints that have to survive this three years? Are we hiding? Are we, are we congregating? Are we broken up? Like, he's kind of referenced a little bit of 30 days. Yeah. Are we, you know, what, what does that look like to you? you know, what, and the other thing is... The other thing okay, okay, okay. Hold, hold on to your next question. Let me answer this one. Oops. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so you talked about the righteous being able to do exploits. Well, if you look at 1 Nephi chapter 14, verse 14, Nephi, Nephi sees that the power of God descends upon the saints, and interestingly enough, the covenant people of the Lord who were scattered, both of these two people, and that they're armed with the power of God in you know, great you know, righteousness. So that's what enables these guys to do these exploits. You know, we don't have time to review this right now, but just go look at uh, the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14. It talks about the power that the people in the city of Enoch received and the people of uh, Melchizedek, who also were under very intense opposition. I mean, the city, most people don't you know, remember, tie these two things, but the earth became so wicked that all the righteous were gathered out and went to the city of Enoch, which was then lifted up. But you know, until it was lifted up, I mean, there was intense persecution, and they were endowed with power from on high to preserve themselves during those times. And I mean, Enoch was able to do incredible things, um, and things that these two prophets in Jerusalem, you know, can do. They have the same kind of power, so. That's how they do exploits. Now, you said, what does it look like? Now, I believe that there is a misconception that comes from the Protestants, that, you know, born-again Christians, that there is this call-out where people are somehow removed and don't experience uh, this trial and persecution. Well, if that happened, it would be the first time in the scriptures. I mean, look at the early saints. Um, I'm talking you know, after Christ's death. Were they called out or were they ripped apart in Roman Colosseums? Did they have to go literally underground? I mean, you go into Turkey and you see some of the things that these guys did to escape persecution. Um, I mean, it was intense for them. Almost all of the 12 original apostles were killed for their you know, testimony of Jesus Christ. They weren't called out. Now, Ezra talks about what it looks like for the righteous in the last days. And I'm going to read you these passages. Now, I'm going to warn you, this is scary, but it serves a purpose. Um, so this comes from 2 Ezra uh, chapter 16, and it starts in verse 70. Now, think about what you have seen in society today with some of the riots and some of the, the rising um, philosophies against your know, traditional Christianity in America, and you can easily see how this, how we could get to this state when you have someone as powerful as this Antichrist leading the charge. For there shall be in every place and in the next cities a great insurrection upon those that fear the Lord. They shall be like madmen, sparing none spoiling and destroying those that fear the Lord. For they shall waste and take away their goods and cast them out of their houses. Then shall they be known who are my chosen, and they shall be tried as gold in the fire. Hear, O ye, my beloved, saith the Lord. Behold, the days of trouble are at hand, but I will deliver you from the same. Be not afraid, neither doubt, for God is your guide. So to me, 
It sounds like things are going to be really tough. And in fact, when you read in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says that there will come a time of tri trial that will be worse than any time since there was a nation. And remember, the Antichrist is going to subject the saints. He's going to have power over the saints. We are going to, you know, experience great persecution. But that persecution is going to refine us. It's going to make us worthy of the tremendous bestowal of power that the Lord is going to pour out upon his saints. And it is because of those horrific trials that we are enduring that the Lord will endow us with this power. And this power will enable us to survive those coming days. In fact, President Nelson said in a talk titled The Price of Priesthood Power, that he says, in a coming day, only those who have paid the price to obtain priesthood power will be able to perform the miracles necessary to save themselves, their friends, and their families. That's this coming day. This is this period of time. I think we're going to be experiencing this period of time soon. Um, and by soon, I mean, you know, within five years, we're going to start you know, experiencing this. But it's my hope that when, you know, one of the things that we know about the Antichrist, again from Daniel 11, it, sa it says that he obtains the kingdom through flatteries. And so I hope that what that means is he's not going to come out swinging right at the very beginning. So it's going to be a gradual increase of persecution. And what he doesn't know is that his time is limited. But before he's kicked out, Things get very bad, very, very bad. But it tries us, it refines us, and it makes us worthy of what Christ is going to pour out upon us. So does that, that answer that question for you? Yeah, I really appreciate it. Do you believe there's a correlation, or at least is it two different people, or is it the same person? When we, when we read 2 Nephi 21 in the rod, and then we yeah. have DNC 85 and a servant that gets the scepter of power, do you, do you believe there's a correlation to the same person, or is this referring to two different people? Yeah, I, I think you're probably talking about the same person in it. In you know Isaiah, he, he talks about several people. It's not just the rod that's coming, but that the rod has insane power. That is his hallmark. Now, many people believe that the rod was Joseph Smith. I just don't, I don't believe that. Um, Joseph Smith is awesome. But this guy, Joseph Smith, was not known. He never used the Nauvoo Legion. He was not known for exerting great power. He had spiritual power. This guy is known for using his great power. And we must assume that he's using it in the preservation of the saints. So, yeah, I think that you are going to see a man of incredible power who arrives in the last days. I think he comes with the... Um, the Lost Tribes of Israel, honestly. Um, because one of the things that we learn from Daniel 11, and this is, this is terrible, but it says that not only does, the, uh, does this Antichrist overcome the saints, he o it says that he over overcomes the Prince of the Covenant. And this Prince of the Covenant, is, he's not talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about the person who administers all the keys of the covenants. This Antichrist overcomes him as well. He's subjected to the Antichrist. So we are going to need people that are coming from somewhere else to save us. And I believe that the rod fits that bill. In fact, you know, all of, all of those things are they're referred to as a cutting. I mean, you have a stem, a rod, you know, a branch, and roots. I mean, th this to me is indicative of a transplanting event. These are the people that were transplanted. When you go to Jacob chapter 5 and you read about the first grafts, the first graft was planted in the worst place in the vineyard. But the second group that is still in the first grafts was transplanted in a place that was worse than anywhere in the vineyard. The only way that you can have someone that's transplanted in a place that's worse than anywhere on earth is if they're not on earth. 
And that's where I think that this, this whole group of four people that are referred to here, the, um, the branch, who I believe is you know, going to be the king of Israel, you know, we, we use the term Davidic servant. That is you know, a modern construct. That, that does not exist in the scriptures. What the scriptures say is David, my servant. This, who people refer to as the Davidic servant, will become the king of Israel. There will be a king of Israel whose name will be David. We are told that he will be raised in his place, meaning it's different from our place. And he's going to come. I believe he's coming with these two prophets that come at the restoration, at the time of restoration. Uh, and the rod is coming with them also. Um, so great, great question. Um, we are going to receive help. And our deliverance is going to be amazing. Now, once this happens, I mean, we are going to, one of the things that the church has struggled with from its beginning is we have the gospel, but we don't have what the gospel really means modeled for us. What happens when Israel is restored? We have instantaneously, Isaiah says, an entire nation is born in a single day that the lands of Israel are overrun in a single day with people. We will be immediately surrounded by a body of people that have been living these covenants for thousands of years, and they model to us what that actually means. And when we see what it actually means to have power in the priesthood, it changes for us. Because it's no longer reading a scripture. It's as if you have the grain of a faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can move a mountain. It's not it's no longer some obscure theory. We see these guys use it. And they show us, do this. And we become like them very quickly. So interesting, Dan. You, you think that, uh, and I never thought of this, so our keys from, that our presidency currently holds that. Mm -hmm. um, because I always saw when the Ten Tribes came back, they would be coming to us for a lot of those priesthood blessings, right? Yeah. And, and we, that we would be endowing them with power through our temples. Yep. But that was kind of like, like that just belief. Um, just, so you're saying our presidency would then, in, in sort of a way, uh, yield to the, to the incoming power that's descending from heaven. Obviously, you know, yielding to the patriarchs of, of, of the ancient world. But I'm saying, like, help me understand what, what you're seeing by that. Okay. Now. Do you remember Lehi's dream when... He saw, you know, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And, you know, this, this is Nephi's, you know, when he sees that. It's explained to him, hey, there will be 12 disciples that will be called amongst you. And they will be judged by the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. And that, you know, your 12 will then turn and, you know, judge your people. But it's clear that the hierarchy is the original 12 and down. Um, now, interestingly enough, when you go to modern revelation in, uh, Doctrine and Covenants chapter seven, th this chapter talks about when, um, John asks Peter, James, and John, and it's, he's probably asking all of the 12 apostles, what do you want me to do for you? He asked all the 12 disciples, what do you want me to do for you? So he probably asked all the 12 disciples, but we only hear what Peter, James, and John said. And John says, I want to be around until you come again, and I want to feed your sheep until that time. I mean, it's, it's clear that, I mean, if you remember, uh, Christ was you know, cooking fish on a fire when, Peter, when everyone came up. And he shows the fish to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? And Peter says, of course I love you more than the fish. And then he says again, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? And well, he said, then feed my sheep. He asks him that three times. And each time he says, then feed my sheep. And then he says, what can I do for you? And Peter missed his golden opportunity. Instead of saying, change me so I can feed your sheep until you come again. He says, I want to come right to your kingdom right away. And that's what, you know, there was a little bit of group, group thing going on because James said the same thing. That sounds good. That's what I want. That's what the, you know, 12 disciples in America did as well until you have someone like John that said, you know what? I heard the message. I want to feed your sheep. Change me 
so that I can be around until that happens. So now listen to what Jesus Christ told John that he would do. Um, let's see. I'm starting in verse 5. As soon as Peter heard what John said, he said, Whoa, whoa, whoa! That's No, he can't ask for that! <laughs> you know, this is where we're jumping in. <clears throat> I say unto thee, Peter, it was a good desire. The thing that you asked was good. But my beloved has desired that he might do more or a greater work yet among men than what he has done before. Yea, he has undertaken a greater work. Therefore, I will make him as a flaming fire and a ministering angel. And he shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation who dwell on the earth. And I will make thee to minister unto him. So something changes. You know, the keys were with Peter while Peter was in the flesh. As, as we know, the keys get transferred to the senior apostle who's living. President Nelson is, in fact, the senior apostle, which is why he's the prophet. John outlives Peter and James. He doesn't die. And so the keys go to him. And this is why Peter and James are now ministering to him, because he's still alive. Um, and he goes on, and he shall minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation upon the earth. And I will make thee to minister for him and for thy brother James. Unto you three, I will give this power and the keys of this ministry until I come. That's the second coming. John holds these keys until then. Verily I say unto you, ye shall both have according to your desires. So John still holds these keys. And in fact, every one of the 12 apostles and President Nelson himself holds the keys because they trace their line of authority ultimately back to John, who came and restored them as a living being, you know, so we know in, in you know, 1830, in the first general conference of the church, um, Joseph Smith said, John is with the lost tribes of Israel right now, preparing them for their restoration. So he's coming back. Um, you know, in that uh, verse that we read in Doctrine and Covenants, they have their own prophets. Remember, when Christ came to the Nephites, in 3 Nephi 17, verse 4, he says, listen, you guys go home, and I'm going to go minister to the lost tribes of Israel, for they're not lost unto the Father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. He took a body of the lost tribes of Israel somewhere else, somewhere in a body that in 34 AD he could go and minister to, and he surely called 12 disciples to lead them. I believe that you know, they were removed from the earth and I believe that they have remained faithful ever since. Um, and so they have their own prophets. They have not lost these things. But there is something special about enduring mortality on earth. And, you know, we have Joseph and Judah who endured their entire mortality on earth. And the lost tribes were spared, you know, that to a large degree. And so that is why the birthright is given to Joseph. And when these guys return, they do have the gospel, but there are clearly some ordinances that you can only receive here. And that's why they come to the children of Ephraim and they fall down at their feet and they're crowned with these saving ordinances. It's not that these people don't have priesthood power. They clearly do. But they need to receive these ordinances here. And the vicarious ordinances need to be performed here. Um, because, I mean, this, this is, you know, this is where people are refined. You know, and there's, there's a lot more that we could talk about with regards to that. But. Good awesome. question. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. All right. You know, anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, it's been uh, it's been awesome, uh, you know, talking to you guys. Um, you know, this is a this is a fascinating topic. I know that it's a scary topic for some people, um, and I mean, honestly, guys, I mean that the scriptures say that when these things start to happen, men's hearts will fail them because of fear. It is going to be scary, but there can be no courage in the absence of fear, um, and just like the children of Israel that needed to go up against entire nations of giants 
Joshua was told multiple times, be courageous. We are going to need to be courageous. We're going to need to be valiant um, to, you know, our testimony of Jesus Christ. A testimony that we're not going to be able to point to anything uh, specifically to prove. But it's going to be the still small voice that we listen to inside. And honestly, because so few people understand this, you know, Daniel, I mean, at the end of Daniel 11, he said that those, the people of understanding will be a great benefit in those days and that they will instruct many. And ultimately it says that they will shine like the sun um, because, you know, they helped. They fed the Lord's sheep in a time of critical importance. So, you know, we need to understand these things, uh, study them. They should be motivating to us. I mean, the covenants of Israel are incredible. That we are going to see them unfold in our lifetimes. I mean, before, I mean, we're not going to look much different than we look right now, honestly, uh, when these things are happening. Um, and it's awesome. What an incredible time to be alive, you know, and to be in a position to be able to help other people to understand what's, what's going on. So. If you were to give us one chapter as you prepare to go here, out of Isaiah, that you think the closest or, or about to cross into, of a chapter or verse in Isaiah, you think we're right on the, either there or on the precipice of better, what would it be? Um, well, you know, there are so many, I mean, Isaiah 51 comes to mind. You know, I love that chapter. Um, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Let me just, you know, read you, you know, something out of it real quick. Um, this, this is very timely. And honestly, it's 51, it's 52, and it's 53. Um, th this chapter is talked about in 2 Nephi 8, um, but I'm, I'm talking about specifically in verse uh this verse 13 this is this is so cool um <clears throat> the lord is talking to israel here and forgettest the lord thy thy maker israel has forgotten the lord that stretcheth forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor Meaning, guys, I know what you're doing. You're here. You're, Satan is on your planet. And one third of the host of heaven. I know it's not easy. I fear for you every day because of what you are going through. Um, <clears throat> but hang in there is what he's saying. Um, as if he were ready to destroy. He's talking, I believe, about... This period of time that we're going to be experiencing when the Antichrist is at the height of his power. And then he says, and where is the fury of the oppressor? And in verse 14, he says, the captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed. The captive exile here is the lost tribes of Israel. He's saying, they're going to come. They're going to take away this burden. I've seen this. Hold on. Wait for it. You know, if you, if you keep reading, you know, in, in this chapter, it's, it's just awesome. I, Isaiah is, is so, you know, awesome. I, I would point you to that verse as one that's, you know, very applicable to what's going on for us right now. So. Uh, Thank you so much, Mike, for doing this. Like yeah. time with us. It was fantastic as always. <clears throat> Yeah, well, really? you, you, you're, you're welcome. You know, I, when I do these things, I mean, my preferred way to do these things is to talk about what you guys want to talk about. Um, because, you know, then, you know, it's, it's what's on your mind rather than just rattling off some, you know, some presentation. So, you know, thanks for doing it in this format because I think it's, I think it's a lot more useful. So, yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah, we'll see you guys, you know. If I don't see you in the next five years, I hope to see you, you know, in some place really cool. <laughs> On the other side. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Thank Take you. it easy. Bye.